Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, ProQuantum High Sensitivity Immunoassays Offer Minimum Sample Consumption with Maximum Performance. It is presented by David Borden, PhD, the Senior R&D Manager and Immunoassay Strategy Lead in the Biosciences Division at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I am Judy O'Rourke of Leverts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.thermofisher.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Borden. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Judy, and thank you, everyone, for joining to learn about our new immunoassay technology. As a brief introduction, I've been with Thermal Fisher Scientific since 2009 focusing on biomarker discovery and validation platforms. I lead a talented team of R&D scientists here in Carlsbad, California, that have developed the assay technology I'll be sharing with you today. I'm very excited to present the ProQuantum High Sensitivity Immunoassay Platform, which was spearheaded several years ago out of our passion to improve protein quantification tools to address unmet needs for immunoassay users like yourselves. The collaborative spirit and application of user-centered innovation across Thermo Fisher Scientific enables us to deliver these powerful technologies to scientists like yourself. My goal is by the end of this presentation, you'll be eager to test out the ProQuantum Immunoassay platform for your specific work. Now with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let me click on the slide two. Uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific offers a wide selection of research tools for the study of inflammation, autoimmunity, and cancer. For today's talk, I will be focusing on detection of circulating cytokines and growth factors, but this technology will apply to other types of analytes as our menu continues to expand. Making sense of the complexities of the immune system requires scientists to use the right tool at the right time, and that's the key here. Whether it be one of our powerful and unique flow cytometry or microscopy solutions, or our comprehensive iWestern workflow, or our large collection of antibodies and immunoassays. Now for this last group, which is my focus area, immunoassays, we already offer a large selection of ELISA's and Luminex bead-based assays. However, there is definitely still more room for advancement. And so what I'd like to do right here is go through the areas of biomarker discovery to validation workflows. And there are three distinct needs. First of all, for the discovery stage, High-plexing solutions such as mass spec systems enable identification of thousands of proteins from a small number of samples. Now, as one seeks to verify biomarkers in a larger sample cohort while reducing the number of potential candidate analytes, we offer Luminex bead-based assays as well as um, other assays that actually can go up to as high as 65 plex. Now, depending upon the target, uh, somewhere between verification and validation, scientists may also want to run Western blots or imaging to verify protein expression, trafficking patterns, or localization with other targets of interest. Now, for today's talk, I'll be focusing on the power of the validation space. We set out to develop a platform that could provide rapid sample to answer, consume little of your precious samples uh, that typically come from unknowable resources provide the better performance, be amenable to high throughput screen as many validation studies involve hundreds or thousands of samples, and finally be something that everyone can afford. Now, so in slide four, I'd like to introduce what we've developed. ProQuantum. ProQuantum combines the best of both worlds 
and is a fusion of matched antibody pair specificity and the sensitivity and broad dynamic range of qPCR. ProQuantum offers the great sensitivity or greater sensitivity than traditional immunoassays uh, using a fraction of the sample that you're accustomed to having to use uh, for multiple replicates. Now, in the case of ProQuantum, two microliters of sample is enough to run up to 10 replicate measurements. The small volume homogeneous assay format means minimized assay handling, no wash steps, and little generated waste, which is especially important for those individuals working with potentially infectious sample types. A broad dynamic range helps eliminate the need to rerun assays because your sample didn't land on the standard curve the first time. Additionally, wouldn't it be nice if you could adopt the next-gen immunoassay technology without having to allocate research dollars for purchase of an expensive single application, in other words, closed system instrument? For quantum assays can be run on any existing real-time PCR instrument that you or your colleagues may already have in your lab. And finally, this is a, a, a passion of mine, is finally after considerable feedback from scientists across the globe, we set out to develop our own cloud-based ProQuantum software. A desktop version of this software will be available shortly for those who are interested. And later in the talk, I'll be providing a live demo of the software. So with that, let's go ahead and talk more about the principles behind ProQuantum. What you see here in the upper left corner of the slide is basically two antibodies, each attached to a blue ribbon and a yellow or orange ribbon. And that signifies basically a 60-mer and 40-mer oligo. So these antibodies, the two different epitope-specific antibodies, are each conjugated to a 60-mer or a 40-mer. And what happens in ProQuantum is as those two uh, analyte-specific antibodies, epitope-specific, uh, bind to the analyte simultaneously, what happens is that binding more or less stabilizes the interaction of those oligos with a splint oligo. And in the presence of DNA ligase, the splint oligo and the ligase basically lead to the creation of a 100 base pair DNA amplification template. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the basics of qPCR or real-time PCR, but uh, you can appreciate that basically um, as the amount of analyte in your sample increases, the number of binding events, of course, increase, and thus the number of template molecules that are created increases, which means that the number of cycles that reach threshold decreases. And what you see on the far right in our IP10 assay is a classic example of a sigmoidal concentration response curve um, that can be fitted to 4PL, 5PL nonlinear regression. Now next, in slide six here, I'd like to go through the assay format, uh, how many tubes there are. What we've really tried to focus on is making this assay very easy to use, very easy to set up, and that starts with minimizing the number of tubes in the kit. We've tried to combine as many things as possible uh, and so basically what you see here on the left side uh, is a picture of the kit, and on the right-hand side is cartoon of the various components. We include two vials of protein standard. These are lyophilized proteins, a bottle of assay dilution buffer, a tube for antibody conjugate A and antibody conjugate B. Those are the two epitope-specific, uh, analyte-specific antibodies. And then the antibody conjugate dilution buffer, which I'll show you in just a minute how that is used. And then on the right-hand side is a master mix. Actually, it, it is a super master mix because there are many components in there, all combined. Uh, and then separately is a DNA ligase. And what I show below the cartoon is what components are combined by the user before the assay is run. Now, what I'd like to go through next is basically the workflow and just how it compares to other uh, technologies out there. And I'm using ELISA as the a comparison example. Now, your ELISA may have more or less wash steps. Uh, it may have uh, different timing, um, but we get the gist here with this comparison. So basically, ProQuantum is a two-step process. The first step is analyte binding, and the second step is basically ligation and qPCR. Now, what I've shown uh, below are in red are 5 microliters, 5 microliters, and 40 microliters. For today's 
explanation or today's uh, webinar, I'm going to be going through basically the five microliter reaction. But what we've tried to do with ProQuantum is basically make this a very flexible assay so that the user only needs to buy one kit. Uh, we all hate if we decide we want to do something a little bit different with our assay that we have to buy an entirely new catalog number. So what we've done is we've basically made one catalog number that can work at the five microliter scale, the two microliter, or the one microliter. The reason for that is people that are new to an immunoassay technology may not be comfortable pipetting two or one microliter. So what we did is we decided to make the, the assay work at the five microliter range. But once the user becomes more comfortable with the assay, they can drop it down to two microliters and actually get two plates worth out of the kit. And for those individuals who want to work in the high throughput space, those in pharma, uh, biotech, those that are automation liquid handling enthusiasts, this assay will also work in high throughput screening. Now, in all cases, this assay, again, uh, as mentioned previously, is compatible with any qPCR instrument. In the case of thermal Fisher scientific instruments, that's in the form of a .eds file that is imported directly. But if you are the owner of another manufacturer's qPCR instrument, all you have to do is present the data to uh, the ProQuantum app in the form of a .csv file. And I'll actually be going through the cloud app more uh, in just a minute. So let's go through now next in more detail how you actually set up the assay. So of course the first thing you do is take the kit out of the freezer, uh, follow the reagents, um, and follow the directions placing them on ice. The first thing you do is actually reconstitute the lyophilized protein standard, follow the directions with the amount and method, et cetera, uh, and wait for 15 minutes. And by the way, uh, we do have a video on our website that provides more detail um, if this webinar doesn't provide enough detail. So after uh, you reconstitute the protein, you let it sit for 15 minutes, give that time for the protein to rehydrate, ensure proper folding of the protein. During that time, the user can then go ahead and create a setup plate. And how I uh, compare or equate a setup plate is basically setting the dinner table uh, before you have a meal. And uh, all joking aside, what it does is, you know, it makes the experience a little bit nicer and more organized. And that's what the setup plate does for ProQuantum. Not only does it help keep you organized, but it also ensures that your diluted samples remain cold. We know that your samples and the analytes in those samples can be quite labile. So we want to ensure that everything stays cold. However, trying to keep a qPCR plate in an ice bucket, we've all been there where ice chips get into uh, the wells, it creates a lot of frustration. So basically just using a, a uh, aluminum cold block can take away all those frustrations. And then finally, the setup plate, what it does is it enables multi-channel pipetting. And that's a really important one here because I think once you see how we run our assays, you may apply this approach to other assays you run. Um, it really does make it a lot easier. So the first thing the user does is go ahead and combine uh, volumes of their antibody conjugate A, B, and the dilution buffer in a microfuge tube, mix, and equally distribute uh, through eight wells, in this case, uh, A1 through H1. After that's completed, then the user will go ahead and dilute their samples. Uh, our dilutions are anywhere from 10% to 30%, and that depends on the assay, um, and you just need to follow the directions in the uh, protocol. So after you dilute your samples, probably 15 minutes has gone by, and that means that your recombinant protein is ready uh, for, a, for creation of a standard curve. So it's a classic serial dilution like any other assay, and you place that on the right-hand side of the plate. So what you see here is you've got three separate parts of your assay all separated out, but notice that they are all in the format, in this case, of a eight-channel, multi-channel pipetter. And that's because in the next step, basically all you have to do is take your setup plate, take a multi-channel pipetter, first populate the antibody conjugates to the assay plate. And by the way, the assay plate is the plate that will go in the qPCR instrument. Um, first you populate the antibody conjugates on the plate, and then you follow up with either the standards and how many ever replicates you choose to run, and then the unknown samples. Mix 
and let that incubate for one hour. Now again, what I'd like to point out here is, again, so far you've seen no wash steps. So after the one hour, basically you, with about, let's say, five minutes before the end of your one hour incubation, you combine your master mix ligase mix and then apply that right on top of the assay plate. So again, there's no washing, no removal of anything. You just add the master mix and ligase on top. At that point in time, you go ahead and place the plate in the qPCR instrument, at which point the ligation occurs, and then immediately following 40 cycles of real-time PCR, or TACNAN qPCR. Now in slide 10 here, I'd like to go ahead and show just some example uh, traces of standard curves, uh, comparing ProQuantum to ELISAs. And in some cases, they're an ultra-sensitive ELISAs or not. Um, and what you see here is, again, the demonstration of a very broad dynamic range, which then, in this case, also leads to greater sensitivity. Um, I list some of the assay characteristics in the bottom right corner. We uh, test for spike recovery in serum, plasma. Of course, we do linearity of dilution, parallelism, inter and intra-assay CV. Uh, we look at specificity cross-reactivity, and then most important, we benchmark to ELISAs um, and perform NIBSC calibration. The benchmarking to ELISA is really important as you're switching from an existing technology to something new. To this day, ELISA is still the gold standard. And what you'll see here in this next slide is what we've done is basically either screened uh, diseased human serum samples and or PBMC supernatants. Now, we tested them on both platforms, ELISA and ProQuantum. Now, it's important to note here, to be able to benchmark one assay with another, if the sensitivity is not comparable, in some cases, we actually have to supplement, uh, we have to supplement small amounts of these analytes with PBMC soups just to get enough data points to compare. So if, if it's undetectable on ELISA, um, then we use the PBMC supernames. But what you can see here is a number of different analytes. Um, and by the way, these human serum samples are from, uh, our, our collection is a lot of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, lupus. Uh, we focus on autoimmunity and various forms of inflammation. And what you can see here across a number of different analytes, there's great concordance and we what you see here also is the slopes are more or less one. And that's because what we've done is we've calibrated our ProQuantum assays to those leading ELISAs to ensure that people are comfortable with the transition from an ELISA to ProQuantum. Now let me dive into a little more detail on a couple aspects. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the talk that uh, this technology is scalable uh, and that you can perform at five, two, or one microliter. But of course, you know, that's a great claim, but you want to see the data. So what we've done here, uh, this is actually done by a person on my team, and we took an assay, an IL-8 assay, and actually performed it manually. There's no automated liquid handling involved here. It's all manual pipetting. Uh, the operator went ahead and performed a five microliter assay, a two microliter or a one microliter, all by hand, same day, same time, and what you can see here is the results are very comparable. Now, to individuals who are more accustomed to plate-based assays where there is a capture antibody on the surface of the plate, scalability is a different story because, of course, when you're trying to capture an analyte, you have to worry about having at least the minimum amount of volume to coat the surface of the plate, the, the mixing time, uh, the mixing temperature possibly, the velocity of the mixing, um, all of those things can play a role in making sure that a um, plate-based assay that's on a solid phase is performed reproducibly, correctly, and gives you great results every time. But the beauty of ProQuantum is it's a homogeneous assay. As long as things are mixed, uh, just like any standard good pipetting practice, it works every time. And that's because it's all homogeneous, everything's in solution, and it's scalable. And of course, qPCR uh, is very scalable too. So what you see here on the far right overlay 
is basically the exact same performance, whether it be the five microliter volume down to the one microliter volume. Now next, what I'd like to go into is a little bit more about the flexibility of the assay. Individuals who are listening to this webinar who have other platforms right now where let's say the platform can uh, read dozens of plates because there's a stacker or something, uh, they might look at this and say, well, wait a second, you know, I've only got one qPCR instrument. How am I going to run dozens of plates? And we do have a solution for that as well. And it's, it's actually a very simple and clever solution. So let's just um, follow along here. So let's pretend that you ran 10 plates. Um, it can be 10, 20, 30, but let's say you ran 10 plates. So you perform 10 plates where you perform your one hour incubation. Um, what you do then is you add your master mix and ligase, but you know what, instead of ligating in a qPCR instrument, let's just go ahead and place all those sealed plates in a temperature controlled incubator for 20 minutes. Now, again, um, everything is sealed. There's no problem here. So t 20 minutes, 25 degrees, and then instead of doing instrument-based inactivation at 95 degrees, why not just use a water bath at 95 degrees? Again, the plates are sealed. Nothing's going to get into them. All you have to do is basically float that plate on top of the 95-degree water bath. You can do them all at the same time. And now what you've done is you have basically frozen everything in time. So now the analyte, the antibodies, all the other proteins, everything is denatured. Everything's been inactivated. The ligase has been inactivated. Because you know what, at this point it doesn't matter. It's all a DNA readout at this point. So what you can do is store those plates until you're ready to read them. And a lot of people who have our qPCR systems actually have stackers attached to our Quant Studio instruments. So you can actually read these out later and one nice benefit is that once the plate is inactivated, it's actually more stable than other platforms where there may be stackers involved, but you're still under a time dependency because things are not inactivated. Things are still happening in those plates. In this case, it's just a DNA readout, and that can be done same day, next day, or even days later. Now, to answer that question of really how long can you go, how robust is this, we performed the following experiment. What we did is we performed IL-12P40 assays on known samples, uh, pooled human sera or individual donors with known amounts of IL-12P40. So we ran a series of assays. In this case, we ran four plates. Uh, we ran everything on, on day zero. We went ahead and performed the one-hour incubation, the incubator-based uh, pardon me, <laughs> the incubator-based uh, ligation, and then the uh, inactivation in the water bath. So then we will go ahead and just store the plates in the refrigerator for up to 14 days and read them on various days. And then calculated or interpolated the concentration of the analyte off the standard curves that were run on each plate on each day. And what you can see here is that we get great CDs even after 14 days. And so the take-home point here is that once you've inactivated your plates, you can let them go as long as you want because, again, it's DNA and it's very stable. So the next thing I'd like to talk about real briefly is some other benefits of the ProQuantum Kit. Uh, one thing that, as an amino acid developer, I've always been very uh, concerned about when you label an antibody, what actually happens to it when you're attaching uh, a various tag or label to it, do you know where it's going? And in the case of ProQuantum, because it's such a sensitive assay platform, you can detect very little changes in antibody quality. And so what we wanted to do is make sure that when we label antibodies, we are not jeopardizing or, or um, uh, compromising the performance of the variable domains. So what we did is we used cyclic chemistry. And what cyclic is, is it's basically an enzymatic labeling chemistry that we, we uh, we provide, and we are able to target the glycosylation sites in the heavy chains of IgGs. And so what we do here is we can have anywhere between one and four biotins, um, but we basically have optimized the reaction to have between three and four biotins per IgG. And of course, the, the streptavidin oligos are attached to the biotinylated antibody. Now, three to four 
biotins per IgG may not sound like a lot. Uh, for those of you out there that uh, work in flow and imaging, you may say, wow, that doesn't seem like a lot. But you know what? Again, it doesn't matter because we're using TACMAN amplification. What I'm showing here on the left side is a series of – bottom left corner, pardon me uh, – is a series of labeling reactions in which we have determined the degree of labeling of biotin on an IgG using a nonspecific labeling chemistry in blue. And in red, you see the cyclic chemistry. So the number of biotins per molecule of IgG in the nonspecific can range in this assay anywhere between 2 and 10. Actually, if you proteolytically digest the IgG, the number of biotins can actually go up much higher, 15 or 20. That just shows you that the biotins can sometimes get buried in the IgG molecule. But with cyclic chemistry, it's very consistent and very tight because it's limited by that enzymology that is in the upper left corner in that cartoon. Uh, so you can only have four biotins at most. Now, in this bottom left uh, panel here, what we did also is we took those particular antibodies and made proquantum PLA probes out of them and then ran various uh, concentration response curves. And what you can see here is that, again, if you're using CyteClick, you get a very tight reproducible result across replicate standard curves. So each standard curve is from a different biotinylation set. Uh, whereas the nonspecific labeling, sometimes you can get something that really performs um, poorly, sometimes mediocre, et cetera. So the, the point here is that you have inconsistent results. So the reason we provide cyclic chemistry to you is that it ensures reproducibility, but also for those individuals that are really concerned about specificity and their variable domains of, of the antibodies, you can rest assured that we're using a labeling chemistry that will never impact that. Now, with the remaining amount of time, I'd like to go through our cloud app. Uh, this slide here, slide 16, just kind of uh, gives a high-level screenshot of, the, of some of the various steps in the assay. Uh, again, we, we started from scratch, from the ground up, building our own cloud-based app. And by the way, again, there is a desktop app for those that are interested as well. Uh, but we built it from the ground up because Myself and, and my colleagues, you know, over the years, we've seen some interesting software packages, but many of them left room for improvement, and they just didn't do what we wanted. So given that Thermo Fisher Scientific has a, an amazing uh, cloud computing initiative, uh, a lot of people are already using it and love it, uh, we decided to capitalize on that and make our own cloud app. And what you see here are various screenshots, and I'll go through more of this in just a minute, but our app has a wizard for the standard curve setup, setting up your plate. Customized lab instructions is something I'll go through in just a minute, but this is pretty cool because what it does is it takes all of those notes that you might have to customize for a specific experiment and what's in the plate and where it is on the plate and all that and basically captures all that for you. It's in a PDF, it can be printed out, put in an electronic lab notebook, but basically we've streamlined all of that so you don't have to sit there and basically make copies of the product insert that you may have, which is in many cases a little booklet. Uh, we want to stay away from booklets. Uh, you'll see our documentation is very short and sweet. Um, and you can then put that in your notebook. Uh, next, uh, sample concentrations. Uh, you'll see more detail about how we present the data to you. And then finally, I, I wanted to show um, Group-wise comparison. We have a modified Mann-Whitney group-wise comparison uh, based on mStats, and that allows us to make some very powerful comparisons with various groups because many of you that are in the translational research space will appreciate that you know, patient populations or, or uh, human subject populations uh, are very heterogeneous. And so the, there's a lot of difference between individuals. And so having statistical software that can actually decipher some of that is important. And then in the bottom right corner, I'm just calling out some of the things I've already mentioned. But again, just to remind everyone that this platform is compatible with any real-time PCR instrument. And then one last little tidbit, and I'll show that or just make mention of it, is over the years, uh, ever since grad school, I've loved GraphPad software. And we actually have a quick way for you to uh, create your own GraphPad 
data files uh, to, to ease that process as well. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and uh, switch screens here. So just bear with me just for a second. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. Uh, let me switch over to the browser. And what you'll see here when you first enter the ProQuantum app are these two large blue rectangles. The one on the left says create experiment, the one on the right says import and view results. Now if you're new to the platform, what you'll see is, pardon me, if you're new to the platform, what you'll see is basically an empty spot down here where it says recent. But once you come back to the application again and again, your recent files, your recent runs will appear down here as well. So for this demo, I cleared everything out of my uh, cloud app uh, account. And let's just start fresh here as though uh, you were new to the platform. So let's go ahead and click Get Started. The first thing you'll see here is an opportunity for you to type in the catalog number. And that's kind of nice because I'll just paste an assay here. Today we're going to focus on the MCP3 assay. But you see, as soon as you enter the catalog number, it provides the species analyte and the stock concentration, um, as well as the recommended S1 concentration for the assay. So the user can go ahead and populate the lot number. Let's just type in a string of numbers here. But what this is nice for is if you want to track your lot numbers, that's also captured uh, throughout the assay um, process, through the um, software process. So later on when you're looking at your data, you can see what lot number you were using. The user can go ahead and adjust the dilutions, the rate of dilution. If you go ahead and choose more than seven data points, the working plate, and by the way, on the right-hand side here is sort of a cartoon of what the working plate uh, is going to look like. It switches to a horizontal position so that it makes it easier. So you would use, in this case, uh, a 12-channel type header, multi-channel, uh, to perform the transfer to the assay plate. But in this example, we're just going to switch to a seven-point curve, five-fold dilution. In this case, we're actually going to look at a data set from a benchmarking study, and we actually ran duplicates on this particular experiment, and we started the S1 concentration at 1,000. Now, if everything looks fine to the user, then you click Next. And what you see here is it automatically puts the standard curve on the left side. However, if you do want it in a different spot on the plate, that's fine. And as I'll show you in just a minute, we have those lab instructions will then explain to you the user and remind them, by the way, you moved the standard curve somewhere else. So it's a customized lab instruction. But for this specific example, we'll stick with the default. Uh, in this experiment, we ran 30 samples in duplicate. And what you can do here is now go through and assign different groups. And this will be really important because what you can see here is you can do anything with the plate layout. You can change things around. You can actually give it a different name. You can uh, go ahead and assign different names. You can assign different colors for all of this because later on you're going to have data that you want to publish, you want to take it somewhere else, and it's nice to be able to annotate everything right away. You can actually also add descriptions, uh, and all this can be seen in more detail on our training video. But if this looks okay, we can go ahead and move forward. Oh, you know what? I just forgot. There's one more thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, what you can see here is you know, if you wanted to do a manual setup where, let's say this is fine and dandy that you have a default, but you know what, a lot of people, uh, scientists, we love to uh, customize things and make things uh, exactly the way we want them. And where we were going with this was, you know what, if you want to add more samples, let's say you want to skip these wells here, and now you want to do some unknowns here, well, wow, if you want to do a manual setup, Clicking each of these and assigning them one at a time would be very laborious. So what we did is we applied sort of a click and drag feature similar to an autofill on Excel. So if you've got one set of unknowns, for example, in this case, already defined, all you have to do is click and drag, and then it autofills for you. So again, that's just a, and by the way, that works in horizontal or vertical. And we're adding more features like that all the time. That's another beauty of cloud applications is that you can really customize them um, on the fly and very quickly. 
So let me just undo that for this particular experiment. So everything looks great. We move on to the next. Okay, so at this point, it's prompting me to go ahead and save the file, save the plate layout. So I'm just going to call it MCP3 Bench for benchmarking. Okay, so right now it's saving the file name or saving the plate layout. Next, what it's going to show you here are the customized lab instructions. And now what you see is it goes through every single step, just like I said at the beginning of this talk. You chill your reagents, you reconstitute your standard. Up here, it also prompts you whether you want the 5 microliter or the 2 microliter assay. It prompts whether you want a fast block or standard block. That will dictate the cycle times. And if I scroll down here, you'll see that it goes through each of the steps that I talked through earlier about how to make a working plate. Create a standard curve. All of this information that we went through is captured on this one screen. And here's your customized plate layout. And then down here, it's providing you instructions on how to run the qPCR instrument. So again, this is all captured. It can be printed out. It can be saved as a PDF. Very convenient. Now, the user goes off, runs the experiment, and then collects a data file. And so now what you're going to see here is a prompt to either upload the data file from the cloud or import it from your computer. Now, if you are an owner of one of our QS3 or QS5 instruments that's already connected to the cloud, your EDS files are already present in your account and, and ready to go. Now, in this case, I'm going to just show you how you import from your own. I select the MCP3 file. And now it's prompting me to pick the plate layout that I just defined. And in this case, here's the MCP3 bench file that I created. And now what's happening is the cloud app is applying um, the settings from before. And so what you see here, and you know what, we've all been in the case where uh, we were at the bench, we planned our experiment, but then things change. Uh, either some samples can't be found, or your supervisor comes up and says, hey, you know what, let's try something different. So there's always need to be able to adjust later. So what we do is we give the user one more opportunity to verify that the standard curve is still the way they intended on running it, that the plate layout is still the way they wanted to run it. And now if everything checks out, the software is applying the 4PL or 5PL regression to the data that I had uploaded. And what you'll see in just a moment is a standard curve. It's important to know here, as you're seeing this little spinning wheel, that you do need to have a good internet connection, um, as well as probably have the amount of uh, recommended RAM uh, in your computer. And so as we go here, there we go, you'll see the first uh, presence of the standard curve. And where, at this screen, uh, you'll be able to apply um, outlier filters, um, various, various ways to uh, look at the data. Um, you can actually go through and also look at it in table format. You can actually go through and look at the amplification plot. That's really important for power users in the QPCR world. They're very accustomed to looking at their, at their uh, amplification plots. And by the way, we now have in our software the ability to change the threshold. It's important to note here that we recommend a 0.2 threshold, that's the fluorescent threshold, uh, 0.2 to uh, determine the CT values. However, in your various QPCR instruments, uh, whether or not it's been uh, calibrated recently or not, et cetera, you may need to adjust that threshold, and we provide opportunity or, or a method for you to adjust the threshold because Ideally, the threshold should be in the linear part of an amplification. It should not be too high or too low. Okay, so if it, everything checks out, you click Next, and now it's basically solidifying those settings for the standard curve. And now what you'll see here, and the reason why I had defined those groups um, previously was because you can see here they show up in different spots on the standard curve. So what we had here is we had basically three different groups, uh, and the group here in green was known to express 
less amount of MCP3 than the other groups. And so what that allows you to do in the subsequent screen, which I'll show you in just a minute, is the group-wise comparison. But before we move to that, I just want to show you that there are different views you can choose. You can change the format of the X and Y axis. You can look at replicates or average. But also you can go in here, and here's where you can export to GraphPad Prism. You can create an Excel file export. You can also create a PDF version report out, which includes even a heat map of the data points and the uh, interpolated analyte concentrations. And what I'd like to show here is that group-wise comparison and the calculated p-values with that. So in the interest of time, I think that's been enough to show the cloud app. It's quite nimble, uh, it's easy to use, and it's available to everyone. So let me go ahead and, and uh, switch back to, to the rest of the presentation to wrap this up. You know, the ProQuantum assay enables new possibilities. Uh, it does allow you to measure proteins in these very small volumes that you might not have been able to measure previously. Uh, the workflow is easy. Hopefully you've come away from this appreciating that it is a rapid sample to, add, uh, to answer. Uh, it's two hours. Um, the cloud app is easy to use. And hopefully you'll see that this assay platform can provide many new opportunities for you and your team. Lastly, I'd like to just show uh, a series of analytes that we've already got on the market. Um, you'll see that our mouse analytes look a little sparse right now. But uh, for those of you that are in the mouse research field, please don't worry. We are, we are working eagerly uh, on, on uh, creating more assays in the mouse field as well, in the mouse analyte realm. Uh, so more to come in the future on that. And finally, let me just say that I want to uh, acknowledge the contributions from my local Carlsbad team as well as the extended teams around the world. We're a global organization. We have uh, teammates as far as Vienna, Austria, and closer to home. And it's, I'm very appreciative of all of the work and contributions from all of us. It's been a, a real team effort, a lot of satisfaction, and we look forward to continuing to hear the feedback from users like yourself to make this essay platform even better. And so with that, I am ready to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Borden, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, do you provide custom service to develop a specific target that I am interested in? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, at this point in time, we do not offer a custom service. However, um, please let me say that uh, don't let that stop you from uh, communicating uh, to us, uh, either through your account manager or reaching out uh, directly on our website, um, or even to myself, uh, even uh, I don't know, even through LinkedIn, whatever. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, we want to hear what targets uh, you'd like to uh, see next on this platform. Thank you. Next one is, is it possible to get ligation of the 3' prime and 5' prime oligo in the absence of antigen? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, so for those of you uh, that have listened to this and uh, may be very um, accustomed to TACMAN uh, genomic readout assays, you might look at that, um, the data that uh, we've provided today and say, wait a second, my no template control or my background is around 38 CT, and, and David, what you're showing us is around 32 or 33. Um, that difference right there is a difference in background. And, and long story short, when you take the TACMAN oligos and, and uh, attach them to 160 kilodalton IgGs, you will have more background than you would in a typical genomic assay. The key take home here, though, however, is that we can still distinguish C 
signal from noise. And so you can still see a very large dynamic range, a very distinguishable sensitivity uh, and selectivity. So you will see some, um, some background, uh, but that's just because we are attaching these Capnan oligos to such large IgGs. But again, it does not affect the assay and the robustness of the assay. Thank you. Next one is, can this assay be multiplexed? Yeah, you know, that's it. It, for those of you who have followed in the literature, and for those of you who know about TACMAN technology, um, you can see that uh, if, if you do have multiple um, oligos, uh, on multiple antibodies, um, that is something that can be achieved. Uh, in the literature, various groups have done various um, extents of uh, expanding the singleplex. Right now, ProQuantum is designed as a singleplex platform, um, but definitely we want to hear from users like yourself as to whether that is something you would like to see expanded upon. Very good. Well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Borden for his presentation. I would also like to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September of 2019. Please share with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.